this yeah, morning. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Robert Causey from the University of Maine, and uh, I've known Bob for Robert for several years now, and he's doing some very inter interesting work with uh, composting and its effect on the microbiological population in compost piles. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. And, and um, I did I did want to say uh, on the outside, I'm a veterinarian, and I, I um, went through the whole veterinary track. Are, any, are there any veterinarians in the in the audience? Oh, great. Okay. Um, a lot of the stuff I've picked up in this any 1441 environmental impact of equine operations has been hugely valuable to me, and something I never experienced in in vet school. And it's just covering the basics, and it's so I think critically important for for. for the welfare of the horse and good medicine of horses. I, I should also quickly uh, acknowledge my graduate student, Alexandria Poulin, who, who would be presenting this, um, were for two things. One, I, I had enough money to bring her down. And the other thing is, um, she just had a, recently had a baby, and so she's um, drawn to stay in Maine, where we're, we're from, and, and, and travel far and as much as she can. Um, so, but she's also, Alex is also very good at PowerPoint. She, cre she finds these nice pictures to, to put in the slides. And uh, we're going to talk about pathogens of horses, and there's probably a lot of, a lot of uh, people in the, in the room here that are familiar with horse pathogens. But I wanted to uh, really bring up a larger question of, of pathogens and what's in the horse manure, because we compost this, and then um, in, in Maine, a lot of this, this material gets delivered to organic farms. And, and these farms are, are growing lettuces and, and, and mushrooms. And recently, with recent legislative changes in Maine, they're also growing pot. But, but regardless, <laughs> that there is there is a potentially a public a public health risk here. I'm not sure if there is or not, but there is some concern about it. Um, and I, uh, where I live, I actually got into compost recreationally. I live on a on a boarding facility, and there's an awful lot of waste produced. And I started helping helping them um, to, to compost it. And the idea was to then sell it to these farms, uh, the, the little organic farms. And to get the organic um, label, you know, the temperatures have to go up. But, um, and there's a lot of um, concern about the nutrient recycling and so forth, but no real requirements about pathogens, antibiotics, or insecticides, or the things that we feed horses or spray on horses that come out of the poop and get into this, and I, I don't want to open this, really open this can of worms too much, but, uh, but it was a concern to me because I worked with strep equi, with a strangles organism, and I had said in a grant, well, if you just compost the, the, um, the, the, the horse manure from strangle infected animals, it won't be a problem. And John Timoney, an expert in strangles, agreed with that. But when you start looking for results and data and papers that prove that, you can, really can't find it. So, so I think there is a gap in the horse side in, in some of this work, and, and I think this group and uh, being involved with this group has been hugely valuable to me for that reason. Um, and again, horse, you all know this, I think, that we have a lot of horses in this country, um, and a lot of people in contact with horses in this country, and maybe there's, there's, there, is, there is some uh, possibility of um, transmission of diseases from, from horses to humans. The ones, the disease that I'm most interested in is are the strep. Um, and the strep equi um, are very similar to the, uh, the human strep path, uh, uh, the organism that causes strep throat. They're not exactly the same, they are quite similar. And in some people, sometimes we can see uh, cases of humans that have been associated with horses, especially sick horses, and developing strep throat-like conditions. And some of the nasty sequelae, including, including um, kidney disease and so forth. Um, in the horse, strep equi is really transmitted. Um, people like to blame veterinarians and farriers and people going from farm to farm for spreading this disease. But this, this disease is really, I think, spread by horse-to-horse -horse contact, mostly. Um, and that's the critical thing. If you look at a history, it's a horses that, that, that are spreading it. Um, and it can be spread by fomites, fomites on the farm as well, and, and, and dogs can, dogs can, can spread it on the farm power, the people are concerned about flies. But ultimately, it's usually involving transporting horses or horses mixing. Um, the, the, the pathogenesis of, of strep equi is, um, you probably were very familiar with it, it's, it's um, or a strep throat kind of disease. It's, it's, it's contagious, it's sort of nose-to-nose -nose contact. 
um, and it, it attaches and then goes through the body and, and it'll be shed in the, uh, both in, in abscesses that the horse gets um, and the nasal secretions. I want to go through this fairly quickly. Um, serious disease because it, uh, when it goes to a barn, it can affect almost all the animals on the farm, 85 to 100 percent. It can shut down a boarding stable for, for weeks to months. Um, and there will be some significant mortality associated with it. These strangles has the name because you have these, these lymph nodes that abscess in the throat and they cut off the air supply and they can literally cause the asphyxi asphyxiation in some cases. So a nasty disease and something we don't want to have spread and the disease is very contagious. Um, some work has been done on the survival of strep equi in the environment and it's, it's somewhat contradictory. Um, and that's kind of what we're getting, going to be getting into here. Some people found that this organism can survive a long time on things like fence posts and so forth. Um, and others found that, that it, was, it was very short on some of these inanimate objects and that by exposing it to environmental conditions may or may not um, keep, it, keep it around. So these results were inconsistent. The other organism I really want to quickly also touch on is Strep equi subspecies Zooepidemicus which is not a pathogen of the horse, it's a commensal in the horse. And it um, is, is quite interesting because I think of it as a barnyard organism, in that it, it's an organism that can, uh, you can detect in some cow, the, the, the mammary gland of some cows, and the original work by, by Lansfield in the 20s, that's where it was, it can get into milk. And in the literature you will find, um, it's still, even recently, Occasionally, severe outbreaks of human disease from people eating either unpasteurized cheese or historically, uh, the great Chicago strep throat outbreak of 1910, I think it was, where the temperatures were so low that winter, pasteurization temperatures didn't go up in these, these old, um, these old uh, dairies that were distributing milk. Didn't reach the, 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 the temperature they had to get to because it was so cold. And so they were distributing milk across thousands of people and they all came down with strep throat. So a serious, a serious condition. And then in the strep, uh, with strep zoo, uh, people gardening can get it and, and there's cases where gardeners have had very serious pneumonia, uh, uh, an immunosuppressed individual, um, very serious pneumonia from, from management working with strep zoo. And also uh, occasion where strep zoo can get into dogs and, and people can get it. So, the point is, is that there, the strep zoo is a particular, is a very common uh, organism in the horse, and that can cause um, problems in people. Uh, this is more just strangles information. Uh, the, the outbreak in Lance for several months. We had two farms in Orono that had, uh, where I live, in the University of Maine, had a severe outbreak, and uh, again, a major, major hardship. So, um, in this study, we wanted to see really ask the basic question, can these two organisms, strep equi that causes strangles or strep zoo, can these organisms persist in compost? If we transmit compost, this is going to be a, a problem. And uh, we, we hypothesized, which was really what I was, was saying, because I talked, well, if we compost this horse manure, we won't have any strep equi in it. 28 days later, um, we wouldn't have any, any um, strep equi in it. So uh, what we did was we, we developed three piles. We wanted to we look at the various potential C to N ratios you might have in those piles. And we went with these um, Dacron bags, which I, I, I owe a lot of credit to my um, uh, Martin Stokes, my department chair at Maine. Um, what we did was we took a Dacron bag, which is uh, just this right here, then we loaded it with compost. This brown circle that indicates compost. Um, and then we... Uh, we so is, to make sampling easy, we'd actually pre put the swab already in, the, in this little bag, waiting to be pulled out. We would squirt strep equi or strep zoo onto it, and then we would attach, wrap up this bag with a, um, we have compost in there, wrap it up with a, a synthetic baling twine and put it in these, in these uh, strung compost piles. Um, each, um, so we were controlling for the depth and, and side of the pile, we would label each of these um, little uh, synthetic bedding twine strands, and then when we wanted to sample a pile, we could just pull them out of the pile and, and not disrupt the pile. When we took them, when we, uh, and we did this over various days, when we took it out, um, we would um, 
count them, streak it out on the plate, and just count the number of strep we found on these plates. Now, these plates were loaded with bacteria, other compost organisms, and it was a trick to sort of differentiate between strep and some of the other organisms. But the strep would always give you these very discreet colonies with a, with a clear colony inside of it. And this is a negative where there's a lot of hemolysis, which was also caused by the strep. You don't see those, those clear colonies. Um, we did using um, uh, oh, I it, it's single carbonate substrate utilization, Barlow is the name. Uh, we did also t go to the effort of identifying a, a sort of a subsample or a market basket of the, the organisms that are actually in the compost pile that we, when, we, when we isolated them. What we found over a 28 day period, well, actually a 14 day period, then we just gave up was that um, no um, strep zoo, we could not, could not get any strep out of this pile at, at 48 hours or after that. There was no, just could not isolate strep from the pile. We, we then went to, when we worked, did strep zoo on the first pile because it's relatively non-pathogenic, we decided to go with strep equi, uh, which would be more concerned and more contagious. Um, we, and then we looked at it at a much earlier period of time, so two to, 48 hours, in case you've missed it, the strep zoo earlier. Again, even two hours, there was no strep zoo, no strep equi isolated from these piles. And what was happening was, to cut a long story short, when we um, inoculated these, these piles right here, we did this in the lab at Orono one day, got all our samples, put them in, kept stepped to store them at room temperature, then took them to the compost pile the next day. And in taking and inoculating them in the lab, and we got high numbers right out of right out of these bags in the lab, then taking them to the compost pile, and these are like a billion, uh, close to ten to the nine organisms in, in these bags. That was enough. That period of time enough at, at room temperature, we felt was enough to actually kill, for some reason, eliminate eliminate the organism. So the organism is dying very. I'm sorry to run through this slide so quickly, but the organism is dying very quickly. And so we had, we had we hypothesized really it was endogenous microflora in the compost that's killing these organisms. So what we did was we um, said I'll just I'll quickly go down to the data and, and, and show it. It's really the simplest thing. We decided to kill all the organisms that were in stall waste in the poop and the shavings. Just kill everything and by autoclaving it. So we autoclaved it, and then we. Um, inoculated strep equi onto the autoclaved bedding, which and the autoclaved bedding is sterile, and also strep equi onto the, the bedding that we were already using, which is non-sterile. And what we found was that we, when you inoculate strep, strep equi, uh, or strep zoo, when the sterile bedding, the strep zoo went out for um, much longer here, 128 hours versus really 24 to 72 hours, than when there was no microflora present. So the strep, the strep is being killed by the microflora in both cases. We looked at the um, moisture and through a sort of some observations, sort of tabletop observations, we realized that it might be, moisture might be a big part of this ability to kill or might affect the ability to kill. We dried um, the, the stall waste over sort of zero hours, two hours, six hours, maybe 48 hours, sorry. My fingers are so big, I keep hitting multiple buttons at once. And um, we found that if after we dried it for 48 hours, that's when we, we would see a loss of the killing ability. Dry it for 48 hours, then the strep would start to persist. So um, we, we found we would then dry the strep for 48 hours in, as, as a sort of experimental model, and then rehydrate it. And having rehydrated, see at what level of moisture did we actually kill the strep. And what we found essentially was there's a sort of a sweet spot in the middle here where of, of sort of, of not, not too much moisture and not too little moisture, not too dry, but just sort of in the middle, sort of Goldilocks region, where we seem to be able to most effectively kill, kill the strep or the microorganisms in the compost can kill the strep. We saw the same thing with strep equi and also with strep soup. So um, essentially, just to, just to quickly wrap up here, um, laid out the piles, we inoculated them with uh, strep equi, strep zoo, we couldn't get any organisms from those piles. So 
at least in our hands, in this small study, the, um, the, the strep does not survive in this pile very well. Um, and we think that what was happening was that in just in a mere 24 hours of transporting these samples in the Dacron barracks, they, they finally, um, the endogenous microflora uh, eliminated them. Um, and that's really pretty much what I'm, I'm saying right there. Um, and so, yeah, so when we, when we uh, in the dry pile, the strep equi persisted, in the rehydrated pile is when we, we eliminated it. Why the, the, the rehydration, um, or the, the various, there was a sweet spot in the sense that if we had too much water in the pile, it may have allowed the strep to survive as sort of a, an issue of, that we could you know, spend a lot of time doing research on trying to decide, figure it out. So anyway, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the story. Um, the microflora kill the strep is, is, is the, the basis of it. And I, I do want to acknowledge our uh, Mark Hutchison especially, who's, who's there in the back, who really helped us with this. Um, and, and the various people on, on uh, Alex's committee, Sue Eric, um, had an army of students that helped us wrap up these bags off the stoves. Um, and staff, Matt Doobie and Sonia Berthazol, and our horses, um, uh, Paul Siciliano said that when you stick out horses in a field, they'll just be eating grass or standing under a tree. Well, sometimes, occasionally, our horses will. Okay. So thanks very much. Are there any, are there any questions? Questions for uh, Dr. Khan? Yes. It was it was right at I was right at the feedstock stage. We 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 we, we put basically fresh um brass. Yeah. So yeah. How bedded? How was it bedded? The 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 the, the salt salt waste. Um it would be it would be with wood, so it was a combination of probably shavings and wood chips. Mark, Mark. You might remember the but the bedding? The yeah. The bedding was shavings. Shaving or shavings, yeah. Any other questions? So what do you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what I would, I, I would still recommend, I would definitely recommend composting it and turning it and doing all those good things because that's, that I would feel pretty comfortable doing that. Um, and I think there's, if, you, if your shavings are too dry, if, if you've got people that are doing a heavily bedding these stalls, um, that would tend to set things up for the strip perhaps persisting, that seems to be sort of consistent. But I think with the, with the pathogen situation, and, and, and it probably applies to a lot of species, but if you go through the right routine of composting, get the temperatures, and if possible, turning them, um, you're gonna be, that's gonna be okay. If you've got any quite <coughs> noise culture, I think if, you, if you've got any concerns. What did you find on some horse farms is unturned static files. Yeah, Absolutely. So you're still gonna get destruction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. What kind of temperatures were you getting? And did you try anything in the lab, just uh, looking at survival as a function of temperature? Um, the, temp the temperatures I was getting on on we we put the temperatures on that pile. I think they were up to uh, one, so about one forty. The piles that I use, we get up to one forty, one fifty quite easily. We didn't do a. Um, I don't recall doing a, a temperature, looking at temperature purely in that way, since we didn't also isolate anything out of the piles. So I, I, uh, we didn't do one of those studies, no, no we should have. But um, in other work that I've done with strep, once you get up to something like, um, I want to say 40 degrees, you know, for, it's not too hot and they start to, start to lose it. Any other questions? All right, thanks. Thank you.